Welcome to the American Security Council Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. The mission of the American Security Council is to educate and engage American citizens on national security matters, economic security matters, and the need for moral leadership in the United States of America. Please enjoy the podcast. Welcome. I am your host, Joy Botcherbeck, here at the American Security Council Foundation. And today we will be discussing how to empower the next generation to become moral leaders. I'd like to take a moment first to uh, say that to, uh, for us to continue these podcasts and programs, we do need your assistance. So if you would go to our website and donate today, uh, www.ascf.us, we would very much appreciate that. Our guest with me today is former field organizer for the Trump campaign, Mr. Thomas Kenny. Welcome, sir. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the field organizing? Well, I was doing my own business. I'm an audio engineer like your producer over here and uh, various creative things and COVID happened. And at the time, as a member of the REC, I was going to, uh, that's the Republican Executive Committee in Indian River, going to many events. And uh, I met the regional director for a field organization in the seven counties in Region 14. And I said, are you looking for organizers? He said, yeah, we have one for two counties. And so that was Okeechobee and Glades. And uh, he hired me. So literally within two weeks, I had another job. COVID had shut down a lot of uh, work in the uh, yeah. corporate industry and things like that. Mm. And I've always had a fascination with uh, politics. It, when I lived in Washington, D.C., I attended a lot of things at the Leadership Institute. Mm. That's Morton Blackwell and uh, Heritage Foundation, where I once met Andrew Breitbart. And so, but I was never able to get my foot in the door up there. And when I moved here, obviously things just changed. And so here I am, and I did field organization for the Trump campaign from basically June onwards, because right when they hired me, they went virtual for six weeks and they held everything off for field expansion mm. until June 15th. So we increased our vote in Okeechobee by two points, went up to 71% of the vote. Uh, every candidate that's a Republican won in Okeechobee, and then the tax collector became a Republican post election so now it's a complete and then in glades uh trump won and in hendry we flipped the county and that's where i met some of probably the most ardent supporters of president trump i'll ever meet so well that sounded was very successful it was a lot of fun it was a lot of work but it was a lot of fun and that's what i want to talk about today especially the Last point you mentioned is the people that are very enthusiastic about this and about the cause. Yes. Um, but I do want to note that the American Security Council Foundation is a nonpartisan organization. Therefore, we're not trying to um, talk about one particular party, but um, we want to channel into the younger generation's enthusiasm and how we can um, continue to support their worthy cause and purpose to inspire everyone. Uh-huh. So if you um, could talk a little about your experience working with the next generation and how do you encourage them to become moral leaders? Um, I think it's just leadership in general. It's moral leaders. Obviously, a good leader is moral. So that's a quality of leadership. Mm. Um, another quality of leadership is they know what they're doing. Now, with young kids... Uh, I had a, a youth who was 17 years old showed up to one of my uh, organizational meetings. I recruiting of volunteers in Hendry County. Her name was Eileen. Eileen is a Cuban American. Her family comes from Cuba. Her uh, father and mom are exiles of Cuba. Mm. Her great grandfather was a 30 year prisoner of Castro. There is family that took the communist oath and stayed. And then there are them who didn't and were forced out. So this is an issue very dear to their heart. They have moral, under, she has moral underpinnings that span back three generations. And so the family taught a lot of that. So that's just ingrained in her. But she was very ignorant about campaigns and things like that. But she had fire in her heart and soul. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's that saying, 
Give me ignorance on fire over intelligence on ice. She had gone to multiple Republican campaigns and they all rejected her because of lack of experience, youthful zeal and no knowledge. Maybe I don't know. But all I saw was someone who wanted to learn. And she became my best volunteer over three counties. She became what we call a neighborhood team leader. And all I had to do was just sort of, here, do this. And she just went and boom, because she was willing to learn. She knew she didn't have the experience. She just knew she had the opportunity. And I think a lot of times we try to control, as adults, people who have zeal, and all they need is just a tiny bit of direction. And you start learning relationally how much direction you need to apply to them. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But most of the time, it's just they're going to do things in a creative way that they are comfortable with, and that is going to get you the optimum result. So what I hear you saying, too, is that um, in becoming a good leader is the ability to be teachable, to learn. Yes. Humility is probably the biggest thing. And I think... Humility, you know, she had the moral underpinning. She, she, had, she grew up in a household where communism had nearly destroyed the family. Where her mother, who was number one in her class in Cuba, who wanted to become a doctor, they withheld her medical education because she would not take the communism oath in school mm-hmm. and had to leave the country. A woman who could you know, like an English professor could teach Spanish, professorially speaking. She's that good. So good that it's hard for her to learn English because mm. <laughs> it's just the way she speaks. And, and as Spanish, it's, it's very ingrained. And I said, you just need to learn English and run for president or run for mayor or something. <laughs> her mother is even more hardcore than her daughter. Wow. But I just remember her daughter coming to our organizational meeting and pulling out a Trump hat and sticking it on her head. Right when I started, I'm like, this girl's on fire, ready to go. You know, naive, but so what? She's not naive anymore. She was the best at what, mm. at what we asked to do. And that's because she just applied herself. And like in her school, she's Dean's, Dean's List and all that. So, you know, I didn't know that. I just knew I had someone who was on fire. And I think a lot of kids today in America aren't on fire about America and what it stands for, like someone who has that personal experience in their family. That's what I wanted to ask you, if you had seen the difference between uh, the younger generation that's coming from places like uh, communism or Marxist leaning or socialist country Absolutely. versus American. Absolutely. I think we take a lot for granted. I've taken a lot for granted. Mm-hmm. Myself. I mean... <laughs> You know, sitting there talking to Eileen's parents, uh, her mom's name's Yamil and her dad is uh, Galaccio, just talking to them. We went and had dinner, my wife and I, and hung out with her family uh, after the election. And just talking to them, I'm just like, I've become more, I've become American like they are. (laughs) (laughs) And I was born here. Because, you know, it's like I was just telling you before we started, they would rather be in Cuba free than be here free. They understand the importance of what America stands for to humanity because they've lived the atrocities Mm -hmm. of what communism and socialism and all this stuff we're seeing today in cancel culture is doing. They became moral really quick they became spiritually understanding really quick, you know? And so I think that's why Eileen was so passionate. She knew more than I knew in some areas just because of the experience of her parents and what they instilled in her as their daughter. I understand what you're saying. I came across someone from uh, Venezuela that inspired Mm -hmm. me as well. What you're talking about. She was, more on fire and knew more than I could say I did so yeah I had three candidates at that organizational meeting and none of them really I had one help the other two 
They just wanted to find out what was going on. What's my angle here? <laughs> and it's just like, uh, when I look at what's happened post-election with Biden and where the um, legislative initiatives are going and things like that, I realize I need more Eileen's. I need more uh, Jenny Avila, who was from Venezuela, worked in the agricultural industry. And basically what happened to her was the business they were working at, the farm they were working at, was squatted on by Chavez and his crew mm. and taken away. She now lives in Cluiston and uh, is doing the same thing in the agricultural industry. But was such an ardent Trump supporter because lived it once again firsthand. She's in her mid-late 20s. She was, I believe, a decathlete. We wow. were always impressed wow. because she would sit out there in August in the heat on US 27 when we do a mm. park rally or whatever right there. And she would just have the flags and she'd spend hours just waving them. And we would all sit back under the thing drinking a water or whatever and going that girl's amazing. <laughs> and then she showed me this poster. She was, uh, she was, she was a marksman in archery and she was a decathlete. Wow. She goes, I used to train in this weather and I can use what I have to, you know, spur on people to vote for Trump. So, because I know, and I understand what's at stake. Kids today do not understand what's at stake in America. Mm -hmm. They're fighting for rights that is taking away their actual liberty. That's yes. the crazy thing. We have discussed that in some of our other episodes as well. Fighting for, quote, rights that take away your liberty. But you touched on something, too, um, uh, with a lady that's the holding up all the flags for so long and her perseverance. So, yes. Um, Moral leaders seem to stick with their values and principles, even if it gets them uncomfortable. Absolutely. Did you, um, well, what happens with the younger generation when they come across rejections? I'm sure that has happened or setbacks on the trail, the campaign trail. Well, both of them, because of who they are and how they were brought up and what they understood, it's obvious an issue when it happens, but it's not an issue to them. It's almost gospel in its origin. Well, you dust your feet, move on. You got to mm -hmm. find the people who agree and who understand and who are willing to listen and turn them from wherever they are into something more, whether that be registering them to vote, getting them out to the polls, or making them an activist like yourself. And so that's, for them, it was easy to do. Matter of fact, it was a passion, nonstop. You know, two young girls, one a professional woman, one in high school, going up to doors all through towns in full Trump regalia, which right now would be even harder. Yes. And basically telling their story or telling the uh, platform of the Trump campaign whatever it may be. Eileen knocked on 6,000 doors. Wow. Jenny was working. She didn't know the campaign was in Hendry County, so she was driving all the way to Broward mm -hmm. to work on the campaign. And Eileen met her by knocking on her door. Oh. One weekday when she was home, she would drive on the weekends out there. And she was their most, she was one of their best volunteers in Broward. So they were like, well, you can have her, but we want her on Saturdays. <laughs> I'm like, I need her on Saturday. <laughs> but still, that's okay. You know, and so she was, a, she was able to walk with um, Eileen and her and, and do the things that we had to do to, to secure Hendry County in their area. And her inspiration, um, Eileen's inspiration, and Jenny has really bled out. Eileen was speaking in Collier County. They invited her to speak. 17-year-old kid. Because of how many doors, she just met all these people by being a campaign person and, for lack of a better term, evangelizing the message of freedom. 
And I think that's the problem in today's America. Kids have don't have enough ingrained understanding to deal with the rejection that may occur. And they're going to have to learn it quick mm-hmm. or there's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. And that's what I've seen coming away from this campaign season because look at what's happening right now. This is... You've got a massive increase over the border. You've got an administration that's not even, they're being immoral with Texas. They're not even telling them who, who has COVID, for mm-hmm. example, and things like mm-hmm. that. I could get into all that minutia. <laughs> In Evanston, Illinois, as I just heard on the way over, you've, they're, they're giving out reparations to the tune of the first 400,000 only goes to black families. Is that constitutional? That's an immoral racist decree let's it's bottom line that's what it is in my view you know so it's really odd what's happening and people are just like we don't care we don't care about constitutionality we don't care about equality we want what's ours and they've made up all these excuses to claim what is theirs and it's not true which goes back to what I was saying about the moral leadership. Um, if we're going to have a future generation with moral leadership, they need to stick to their values, regardless if it gets uncomfortable with this cancel culture. And issues. I think, yeah, and I think justice has been one of the big things that has happened, or, you know, or lack of. What happened in the Trump administration, whether you agree with it or not, there was no accountability in terms of what happened to his presidency on things like Russia and the other stuff that occurred with uh, Hillary Clinton and things like that. And so, you know, a lot of people just look at it as it's a game, which Mitch McConnell once said, I love the game. He loves the political dealing in the game. Well, hello, that's immoral. Mm. That's an immoral outlook on it. And you don't deserve to be who you are playing that way. You've gotten there playing that way, but you deserve it no longer. You never really did. And I think that's been one of the big issues. We've seen an immoral leadership from on top that doesn't serve. They just take They don't serve, and they don't serve the greater good of freedom and liberty. Mm -hmm. They serve the personal wealth of themselves, whether that be through position, power, money, whatever that they're they're pursuing. It doesn't make you a moral leader just because you can play the game. No. Good. (laughs) Just because you hit an issue here or there on a speech or on a vote. No, it doesn't. Mm -mm. So it's it, to me it, there's a lot of people that are that just need to be cleaned out on both sides. And speaking to the uh, cancel culture, and did you guys um, experience any censorship or cancel culture issues on the campaign trail? No, I didn't personally. Okay. I can't speak to Eileen and Jenny's experience. Uh, I do know that you get typical rejection at a door. Like I went to a door and I didn't wear a mask. Now I knock on a door back up six, 10 feet, which was actually strategic because you can see in the house if people are home or whatever helps you move faster. But I would knock on a door back up six to 10 feet and I'd stand there and I had a mask with me. I had one person ask me to put it on. And he was just being sort of, uh, he wasn't even registered to vote. He just wanted to know all this stuff. And anyway, he actually gave me a mask to wear. (laughs) He was yelling at me about it. But, uh, and then I had another person goes, where is your mask? And he came to the door. He was a Biden supporter and I knew it. Came to the door, he's like, where's your mask? I said, where's yours? Because he didn't have his on. And then that was the end of the conversation. So, you know, there's, there's that pettiness about it mm-hmm, sometimes. Mm-hmm. But really, uh, for the most part, people were very willing to talk, even on the left, to me. I'm wearing a Trump hat or my fake news hat or whatever, my 
my regalia, so to speak. And people were more willing to have a conversation or they would say, no, I'm not with you. Bye. And they'd be okay. quasi polite about it. It's not as bad as people think. We, you know, I think a lot of times in our own mind, we make up what it would be like so we can talk ourselves out of it. And you have to push through all that. Did you find people um, willing to thoughtfully debate with you? Yes. Okay, that's good. Yeah. I actually I had a great conversation with uh, the Democrat um, county council candidate in Okeechobee County. And I'm trying to remember his name. His first name was Dimitri. But I can't remember his last name. And it just escapes me. You just Your question brings it up. I, and I knew where he... I saw his name on my uh, list. I was going to talk to everyone. Republicans, independents, and Democrats. At first, I only talked to Republicans thinking, huh, you know, I'll get less confrontation. So I had to work through all that. Mm -hmm. I was just like, no, we need to... We need to go. I found out that Democrats are voting for Trump. So I'm like, I need to go out and talk to everybody. They knew. A lot of people knew what was going on. And so I went to his house knowing who he was. So I did all the houses around his house. Then I went to his house because I wanted to have a conversation with him. And we did. We spent about an hour on his front stoop just chatting about things. And uh, he asked me about conservatism. And I answered him, and it was a question about economic conservatism. And I basically, he goes, it was about business and capitalism and things like that. And he goes, why is it important? Why does it have to be sort of untethered, so to speak? And I just looked at it from the essential idea of New Deal and things like that. I said, look, I go, big business loves government. They don't want to be... Uh, disassociated with it. Why? I go, take GE, for example, who was in the Obama White House most out of anybody. He loves having that relationship. Jeffrey Immelt. Why does he love it? I said, if you start a small business and build a better dishwasher, he's going to work with Obama to keep you from getting into the market. You know, you're not going to be able to innovate because, A, you're going to pay everyone $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to go through all these regulatory hurdles on the environment so your dishwasher spews out clean water and all this other stuff. Meanwhile, he's going to have all this money behind him and machine processes that you don't have where he can scale to the regulation and you can't. I said, that knocks you out. And now you have this great dishwasher nobody can use. And he goes, no one's ever told me that. I said, that's what's going on. So, you know. Very good point. I can see you're very <laughs> enthusiastic about this. And that's himself. a moral question. <laughs> Ultimately, philosophically, that right there is a moral question about liberty and freedom mm -hmm. and the ability to present your, yourself to the marketplace, you know, with your idea and bring it to... Uh, humanity to make life better for everyone. Yeah. And, and That's very Lockean, so to speak. <laughs> you, and you're very knowledgeable on that. Now, the younger generation, were they also able to have some thoughtful debates with people? Well, they're not as, I would say just because of my age and what I've read and understood, they haven't, they just haven't had the experience of time to absorb all that, but they understand it when you tell them. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll have their questions. Hey, how do I explain this better? Things like that. A little nuances. But obviously, they're, they're very, uh, everyone feels it in their heart. You know, everyone knows freedom is right. You can't say freedom is wrong. The only people who are saying freedom is wrong are burning down your streets in the summertime. <laughs> you know, so, and that's what they do. They want to upset what freedom has brought so as to degrade the society so much that we need to take it over and make it better. Well, yeah, you just destroyed it, <laughs> you know, with your stupid arguments. Well, my, my last um, podcast, we were discussing the same thing and taking away our history and our culture now that allows for new indoctrination. 
Exactly. But mostly taking away the functionality of what uh, capitalism and the idea of contract has brought. You know, Devray McKesson, the man who led the, the guy in the vest who led Missouri's uh, Ferguson mm. for BLM at the time. Mm hmm. Devray, is it Devray? I was just reading about that, yep. Yeah, who then went to, I believe it was Yale, and gave a, gave a lecture on the right to destroy someone else's property in terms of protest. He's communist. And people are like, you don't understand. I had a friend who worked in the Obama administration as a photographer, met Devray, and sat and talked with him. He said, you don't understand his heart. I'm like, yes, I do. He doesn't believe in your right to own that camera. He'd rather destroy it if it's not used for his benefit. Which is against the law. And exactly. we, we just talked about that in my last episode as well. We were on the same subject of crossing the line where we have the right to peacefully assemble. But when you cross that line. Right. But the, the, the reality of what's going on that I'm finding, uh, it's about the American identity. And, it's actually, and the American identity goes beyond just under the guise of America. It's about human identity. We're dealing with biological distortion as normal. We're dealing with uh, racial distortion and inequality as something that should be done to rectify something that happened and was rectified. Mm. But the idea is, you know, we want to break down that identity of equality among the races. We were coming to it we had come to it, civil rights movement, and here we are pulling it, taking it away. People want to take it away. We're dealing with that. Uh, the morality of basic things, yet Cardi B, the big story on the Grammys right now, you know, I don't perversion <laughs> as normal, the new normal. And so you're taking away the human identity that's really what's going on. And that identity spans across all races, classes, and it goes beyond America. And that's what we're seeing globally. It's about your identity and who you are. Who has God made you to be? And in that freedom that he's given you, what are you going to do with it? Kids don't understand that at all. You know, we lost a great broadcaster whose whole... Uh, notion was talent on loan from God, which behind it was, this is who God made me to be. And that's why I do what I do. And he did it the best we've ever seen it. He held number one for a third of broadcasting life. Mm -hmm. Broadcasting has been around since the late twenties, early thirties. And he held number one in that medium for a third of it, 30 some odd years. So that's the point of it. And we're seeing an attack on that identity in all places, in all types of, all across the culture. And it's horrible. It is. And I, I know we went off track a little bit yes. from the <laughs> from empowering the younger generation, but, but that's important because they can't lose their identity either. They have to keep who they are and their values and their principles to be good moral leaders. And I think I hear you say also to be teachable and to persevere. Uh-huh. And I think that's, you know, that comes from the home. With Eileen and, and Jenny, they both had strong backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, Eileen's family is, they understand who God is and they understand their purpose in life and they've been challenged directly by communist rulers and many in their family have persevered and prevailed and overcome granted they're here now doing that but that's important so for Eileen it was very simple uh, transition into doing the activist work that she did for the campaign for, for American kids you know, we don't see it because we live in it every day. We grow up in freedom. We grow up in, hey, you can be the best you ever want to be. And what's the big thing in schools with, uh, with a lot of kids that drop out and things like that? 
schools this white hegemony, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And, and that's and all our that. time where we're going to have to wind down here. But any last thoughts that you would have to say to the empowerment of the younger generation? Empowerment. As adults, we have to gather those that are on fire with zeal and want to participate and just let them do it. Let them make mistakes. Let them fall on their face. Let them ask questions. You as a leader are going to have to serve their uh, their life so that they reach their destiny. Eileen wants to be a senator someday. She wants to, she loves the political life. My job was to get her moving. It wasn't to lord it over her and, you know, be a critic. Wise words. <laughs> you had to say, no, very good advice, I think. And thank you. Thank you for joining us today on this um, Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. Well, thank you. I could talk about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll have to do another series. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> and... Um, To all of you joining us today, our podcast can be found on YouTube and Rumble. Just type in American Security Council Foundation. Uh, You can also find us on your Apple or Android phone um, podcast platform there. Please subscribe, uh, leave comments, and um, like our podcast to help help us get the message out. Also, go back to our website again at www.ascf.us to donate today. Thank you for joining Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. Until next time, be safe.